All right, so as I mentioned in the announcements, you, we have our, our challenge for the month of December, closing out the year. We've had a lot of challenges this year. I like doing the challenges. I like challenging you to do more just spiritually with your life, with your service to God. Uh, we, we ought not to just allow ourselves to get too comfortable with the, the work that we're doing for the Lord. We don't want to, because the problem with getting comfortable is you have a tendency to just get complacent and just maybe fall into routines. Routines aren't always a bad thing. It's good to have a routine. It's good to keep up, especially with a minimum of service. But we always want to strive to do more, right? We're running a race. We want to we want to try to win. We want to we want to do what we can. And we also don't want to let certain aspects of our spiritual life fall by the wayside either. So we take I've been taking months out throughout the year and kind of putting a focus or a spotlight on different areas in order to help overall the goal. The goal for, for these just in general overall is for you to make the time and to prioritize your life to make time for everything and that you don't get imbalanced and get way overboard on any one area in your life spiritually, but that we can be uh, fruitful in all things right? So all things that, that God wants us to do, you know, you can be reading and reading and reading and reading and reading your Bible and reading your Bible and reading your Bible all year, all day, but then missing out on so many other areas and you become very imbalanced. And I think even with all of that reading, you won't gain the amount of knowledge that you would gain by putting all of that wor those words into practice through prayer, through soul winning, through you know, other means and ministering to others. There's so many things that all kind of play together in, in God's plan for our life spiritually to get the, the maximum amount of growth that we can as a child of God. So we focus on the thing. So like if you just let reading go out the window, you know, and you're not doing it at all. Well, no, we need, we're going to do a challenge. We're going to, we're going to emphasize this is really important. You need to be in your Bible. And then we're going to emphasize prayer and you need to be praying to God and praying for people. And you're going to emphasize going out and reaching the lost. And that's a, you know, that's a focus. And even with singing praises unto the Lord, people might laugh or scoff at this. And I said, it's a fun challenge, but it's not, it's, it's still a serious challenge. Okay, it's a lot of fun. You should enjoy it. It should be very joyful to complete this challenge and to do this challenge. But it is still an important aspect as a child of God that we ought to be singing praises unto the Lord. Amen. So um, I don't want this just to, to go by the wayside either in your life. We ought to have praises to God regularly continually and this is a great time of year it's a, it's a great time of year to do it for many reasons one is just the type of music if you like the christmas songs and stuff those are easier to sing it might help you just be easier to complete the challenge but also it's a time of year where you should be reflecting on being thankful you know enjoying maybe more spiritual things in general i love the christmas season at least when it's focused on jesus christ i don't like it when it's focused on other things and on commercialism and on santa claus and all that other garbage out there but when, but when people are talking about Jesus Christ and the birth of Jesus Christ, and that's what it's all about, that is a great thing. That is a wonderful thing. I love this time of year. I love when people are focused on the good things of God. So um, the challenge is twofold. One is to eliminate music that we shouldn't be singing and listening to, which is this world's music. The world, the, the, the garbage that's being put out there by the whores and whoremongers in, in uh, the music industry, okay, and, and, and singing their words and singing their songs and getting the word of God in our hearts and getting godly songs and spiritual songs in our heart and singing those with praise unto God. So we're getting rid of one and we're adding something that's, that's much better that we should be doing anyways. Now, hopefully you don't even have to get rid of the worldly music because you've already done that. I don't know. But wherever you're at, if you've already done that, hey, let's focus on singing these hymns for this month. Right. Now, we started off in 1 John chapter 2, so I'm going to start off just preaching why we need to get the worldly music out of our life. Why is it a bad thing? Why, should I, why does it matter? And if you've been coming to church for a while or reading your Bible for a while, some of the things that you might think aren't that big of a deal, you'll start to realize the more you study, the more you read, the more you hear sermons preach, 
that actually God does care about a lot of things. You know, people think, oh, what does God care how I dress? Well, you know what? God does care how you dress. What does God care, you know, how long my hair is? Well, you know what? God does care about that. And if you read your Bible, you know those things. You know those things. I preach sermon on those topics. What does God care what I listen to? God does care what you listen to. And just first of all, if you just think about it, without even considering whatever the music is, just think about what you're allowing to put into your ears is going to have an impact on you. Whatever you're choosing to listen to, to absorb, to bring in. Now, obviously, we should be filtering what we listen to, but the bottom line is if you're choosing to fill your mind with the same stuff over and over and over again, it will impact your actions. If you listen to music that glorifies drinking and fornication and this is what's always coming out of your speakers and going into your ears, guess what? You're going to be a lot more likely to get involved in those types of sins be just because it's going to be on your mind a lot more. Right. We ought to be thinking about holy things and spiritual things and godly things and not lustful things and things of the flesh that are glamorized and glorified by this world. And this world's going to tell you, oh, it's all about feeling good and doing, you know, whatever you want or rock and roll, right? How about, how about rock and roll is a great example of, of something that promotes just all ungodliness. Right. Rebellion. Oh, no, don't listen to authority. Don't listen to anything like that. We don't want to have any rules. We don't want to have God over us. We don't want to have anyone over us. That's rock and roll. That's the message, the overwhelming theme of rock and roll. How about the fornication and the drugs and the drinking and the binging? That's all part of rock and roll. It comes out in the music. It comes out in everything that they do. This is not something you should be filling your mind with. This is not something that should be going into your heart and coming out of your lips. It's wickedness. Just think about it. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 2, look at verse number 15. The Bible says, love not the world. Neither the things that are in the world. Look, we're not of this world. Amen. If you're born again, you're a child of God. You know, you, you have a spirit inside of you that's been born again, that is born of the perfect seed of God. You are a child of God. You are not of this world. Now, who is the God of this world according to Scripture? The God of this world is the devil. And all the things of this world come from him. And that's what I'm talking about, worldly things. When we use the word worldly, we're talking about what the Bible's talking about here, the things that are in the world. Let's keep reading there, verse number 15. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. The Bible's saying if you love this world, if you love everything this world has to offer, you don't love God. Right. Love of the Father is not in you. You don't love the Father. You love this world. You can't have both. You say, oh, but I love God, but I also love the world. Not according to the Bible. The Bible says if you love the world, you don't love God. It doesn't matter what you think or what you think you feel. It, according to God, he's saying, you don't love me. And that's what matters. You can say you love him, but if you love this world, God's saying, you don't love me. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So if you're going off and doing wicked things, do you love Jesus? No. No. By definition of, of Scripture, from the Word of God. Look at verse number 16. For all that is in the world, and this is what we're going to see, what is it in the world? The lust of the flesh, so things that of your, in your, your body, your flesh, the things that you desire to have, that's the fornication and the drinking and all that stuff that goes along with your flesh. The lust of the eyes, what you're setting your eyes on and viewing, you know, the eye candy or whatever it is that you want to feast your eyes on. The scantily clad women or... or you know, whatever it is that's appealing through lust to your eyes and the pride of life. The pride, the people are super proud. Now, who is more proud than, than the, the celebrities, right? The, the, whether they be movie stars or music stars, right? These rock stars, these idols that get up on their stage and have everybody worshiping them. And, and just eating it up. It's not right. It's wicked. 
So the Bible says here that all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. Those are worldly things. Verse 17, And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. In James chapter 4, turn if you would to 1 Samuel chapter 16. James 4, 4 says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. That's some strong language. Okay? We're not supposed to be loving this world. We're not supposed to be loving everything the world has to offer. We're not supposed to be loving all the junk that the world is putting out there for you. And if you love the world, you're an enemy of God. I didn't write the Bible. I'm just preaching. I'm, just, I'm trying to point out some verses that maybe you missed, that maybe you skipped over in your reading, that maybe you don't want to apply a certain way because it's easy to read that stuff, but then when you start making the application, that's when people don't like it very much. Oh, yeah, that's great. Yeah, I don't love the world, but I'm going to listen to all the world's music. We need to remember and learn and understand that music is very powerful. Again, this isn't just some little thing, so no big deal. Oh, who cares? I just like the way it sounds. Music has power to it. Music is actually extremely powerful. And, and you are not wise if you're going to blow off the amount of power that music can have in your life. We have examples in Scripture. I'm going to show you an example in 1 Samuel 16 just of the power that music can have and of the power music can have spiritually in your life. Because music is spiritual. If you notice on the front of our hymn books, it says soul-stirring songs and hymns. And you know what? That's true. These songs do stir your soul. They stir my soul. But these are songs and hymns. Hymns aren't the only type of music that get into your soul, though, that can affect your spirit. All kind of music can do that. Now, we're going to see an example here of, now, this is good music, but we're going to see how impactful this good music can be spiritually. This is a problem that Saul has, where Saul has sinned against God. Okay, in this context of the story here, Saul is the king of Israel, is the first king. He sins against God multiple times, and he's being disobedient, and he's being rebellious unto the Lord. And as a result, God is taking his spirit away from him. See, God was blessing him. God had you know, put his Holy Ghost on him to be able to do mighty works and to be able to win victories and to lead the children of Israel. But when he, when he sinned against God, and he willfully sinned against God, then God says, you know what? No more. I'm not going to be with you. I'm actually going to put someone else in your place, someone who's better than you. Because you are not the type of person anymore that ought to be leading these people. So Saul has this problem, and it's a spiritual problem that he has with God. But he chooses to turn to music to solve his problem with God instead of dealing with the problem that he has, the way that he ought to deal with it is directly with God. With repentance and getting on his knees and, and begging God for mercy and forgiveness and getting himself right with God. That is what he ought to have done. And see, when, when you get into sin... Anyone today who's saved, you have the Holy Ghost residing inside of you, you ought to be feeling some level of guilt or remorse or conviction for doing wrong. And you can deal with that one of two ways. You can try to ignore it. You can try to do everything you can to get your mind off of it. You can try to occupy your time through other means and try to gain other pleasures that's going to make you feel better and just completely ignore the problem. Or you can just deal with the problem. And I'll tell you what, any time you just try to get rid of that and you don't want to deal with it, it's just going to get worse and worse and worse. And Saul's a prime example. When Saul didn't deal with his problem, you know what? It ended up in his death and the death of some of his children. That's where it, end, that's where it led him because he didn't deal with it the way he was supposed to. He just kept going further and further away from the Lord. Look at verse number 13, 1 Samuel chapter 16. 
The Bible reads, the Sa Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. This is when, when Samuel anoints David, and God is basically choosing David to be the next king of Israel. He's the one that God's going to raise up to be in that, in that throne. And he's the one who has the power of God, the Spirit of God that's come upon him at that time. But then look at verse number 14. It says, But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. So God is no longer going to be with Saul. His Spirit departed from him. And it says, And an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. Now it says an evil spirit. You might think, Oh, what is that? You know, is Satan attacking him? No, it says an evil spirit from God. Right? From the Lord troubled him. God is, is the one purposefully sending an evil spirit to vex Saul. Why? Because Saul is a child of God. And he's trying to get through to him. So he's sending this evil spirit to bother him, to vex him, to, to try to bring him back around again. But what does Saul do? So he's got this, this spirit that's just troubling him. Right? He's bothered. And verse number 15 says, And Saul's servants, so Saul's servants, they have this great idea. They're like, hey, you got this problem, this spiritual problem. I know how to deal with this. Behold now, an evil spirit from God troubled And they know it's from God. They know he's being bothered by it. You know, it's not like they don't understand this. They know what's going on. They know what's happening. But instead of saying, Saul, get on your knees. Get right with God. What do they say? They say, let our Lord now command thy servants, which are before thee, to seek out a man who is a cunning player on an harp. And it shall come to pass when the evil spirit from God is upon thee that he shall play with his hand and thou shalt be well. So, you know, all we need to do is just get someone who's really good, real cunning at playing the harp. So he's going to play this beautiful music for you and then everything's going to be better and you're going to feel all right again. You're going to get well. You're going to feel well. And that spirit, that evil spirit that's bothering you is going to go away. And then it says in verse 17, And Saul said unto his servants, Provide me now a man that can play well and bring him to me. So that's what he does. And you know who he finds? He finds David. Now, David has the Spirit of God on him. And when David is playing music, do you think he's just playing the worst kind of worldly music for Saul? No, he's probably playing the right music. He's playing good music. He's playing good, godly music. But in verse 23, if you want to jump down there, it says, And it came to pass when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul, that David took an harp and played with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well. Look at this. And the evil spirit departed from him. Now, why am I pointing this out? The main reason I'm pointing this out is to show you that by the playing of that music and the listening to music, it caused an evil spirit to depart. So this is going to show you some of the power that music has that you might not have realized music can bring. Okay, now, now in a sense, this is a good power because it's good music being played and it's driving away an evil spirit. The problem is, is Saul, of course, not dealing with the problem the way he was supposed to and that God actually wanted him to be bothered with that spirit and didn't want it just being, you know, brushed off. And the thing is, too, with this, this power ends up fading from being able to make the evil spirit depart because as you read, you're going to notice that David's going to play when the evil spirit comes and then that evil spirit's not going to go away. And Paul pick, Saul picks up a javelin and throws it at David to try to kill him, <laughs> right? And he's there trying to help him by, by playing his music, told, doing what he's told to do. And, and Saul tries to kill him because it just gets worse and worse and worse for him because he's getting further and further away from the Lord by not being obedient unto him. So there is a lot. Now, in this example, you can see how, yeah, the music was, was being used to drive away evil spirit. Don't you think that it works the other way as well? That, that music is powerful enough to draw the evil spirits, to draw the bad things, and to push away the good things? Absolutely. Absolutely. I didn't prepare all kinds of examples and evidence, but you can see, first of all, music just being used spiritually in so many religions just in the world in general. When people get possessed by devils, and yes, they get possessed by devils in these Pentecostal churches where they're rolling around on the ground and they say they're speaking in tongues, but they're really just, just blabbering with their mouth and no one understands a word that they're saying. And they say, oh yeah, it's the Holy Spirit. No, it's not the Holy Spirit. They may have a spirit, but it's not the Holy Spirit of God. But you know how they always get in the spirit? It's through playing a lot of music. 
And, and usually it's the heavy drum beat and just, just bringing in that evil spirit for people to be possessed with devils and, and get into this kind of nonsense. And it's the same thing in, in voodoo stuff. It's the same thing in, in many areas. And like I said, I'm not going to get into all the, the various areas where you can see it evidently with, with evil, wicked spirits coming in. But you can look at and listen to. And, and this is something that, that I was real big into, especially with the rock music. I've read books. I've listened to interviews. I've read articles on these people. And, and band after band after band after band after band is talking about how they fe it felt like they had an extra spiritual influence or there was another member to the band that was there playing with them together and how they got their, um, their music and their ideas for the music and, and how they felt like it almost felt like someone else was taking over when they're playing their guitars and when they're playing their instruments look there's example after example of this stuff happening and this isn't just all in their heads when God created Satan he created him you know his cords and his tabrets were beautiful the Bible explains in the book of Ezekiel how how um, he made him not just like in his appearance beautiful but he also gave him, I believe, musical abilities when it's talking about uh, how God made him. Turn, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter 31. Deuteronomy chapter 31. So recognizing the power that music has spiritually ought to make us take a little bit closer look on the type of spirit in the music that we're listening to. What type of spirit is it? Is it a spirit from God? I mean, when we, when we sing these songs and it's got great doctrine in it and it's got some Bible in it and it's got, you know, you know the word of God literally put to music in some cases and it's talking about really good things, do you think that's just going to bring an evil spirit? But how about when you're listening to the music that's glorifying all manner of sin, that's, that's glorifying the flesh and lust thereof and the pride of life, do you think that's going to bring you a good spirit? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Not only is music powerful, but music, the songs stay with you. They stay with you. It is, it is powerful in the sense that it's spiritually powerful. It's powerful in the sense that it doesn't go away. I wish I could erase the volumes of stupid worldly songs that I've got just embedded in my head. Why? Because I listen to it over and over and over and over and over again, and this music's catchy, and all you got to do is I could hear two notes, and I could probably tell you what, what a whole bunch of the garbage that the world's put out, not the new stuff, but all of the old stuff. I could, I, I could just start rattling it off, probably start singing the songs, maybe even to completion in many cases. And I'm not bragging. Look, this is not a good thing. I'm not standing up here saying, oh, I know my music so well. I, at one point, that is how I was. When I was eaten up with the pride of life and into all the world's garbage. But now it's a plague. Now it's a curse. I don't want these songs just, just coming into my head and, and filling my mind with any of that garbage. I'd never want that to happen anymore. And the more you, 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 you know, fill your mind with, with things of God, it helps to get that stuff away, but it's never gone completely. It's never gone completely. In Deuteronomy 31, we have an example where God is giving Moses a song. God is explaining to Moses, he says, you know what, you know, He's given you the law. He's given everything. But there's going to come a time they're going to turn their backs on me. They're going to go after other gods. They're going to completely just get away from the Lord. But you know what? This song is going to be with them. Why? Because songs are powerful. Because it's going to, he knows it's just going to stay with them. Even when they're completely away from God, you know what? This song is going to be there. So this song is a song that's meant for good. There's a good purpose for this. But like I said before, the, the, the way that the music works, it could be used for good or for bad. Okay? So, so I'm not saying that songs are bad. A song's a song. Good songs are good. Bad songs are bad. Right? It's a real simple concept. The good songs, A, it's great because it'll stay with you. It can help teach you. 
and we can learn from them. And, and you can teach your children with the songs. They're great tools, but at the same time, it's a two-edged sword because songs can be really bad and they're still going to stay with you. Deuteronomy 31, look at verse number 19. The Bible says, Now therefore write ye this song for you and teach it the children of Israel. Put it in their mouths that this song may be a witness for me against the children of Israel. For when I shall have brought them into the land which I swear unto their fathers, that floweth with milk and honey, and they shall have eaten and filled themselves and wax and fat, then will they turn unto other gods and serve them and provoke me and break my covenant. He's already told Moses this is what's going to happen. He already knows they're going to, they're going to turn from him, they're going to get real fat, they're going to have all this, this blessing, and they're going to turn away from the Lord. But look at verse number 21, it says, And it shall come to pass, when many evils and troubles are befallen them, that this song shall testify against them as a witness, for it shall not be forgotten out of the mouths of their seed. For I know their imagination, which they go about even now, before I brought them into the land, which I swear. He's saying, this song, so I'm teaching you this song, and you're going to teach the children of Israel, and they're going to teach their children, and it's going to continue through generations, and they're going to learn and, and know this song. And then when they're finally away from God, and then they're being punished, and God's disciplining them, and, and he says they're going to remember that the song's all of a sudden going to ring true for them. And it's going to be a witness to testify against them, you know, showing them, well, why did we turn away from the Lord? That's why all these bad things are happening to us. And it's something that, that's, that's meant to just show them, oh, we did wrong. But the song was powerful and the song was given so that they wouldn't forget. Because it's easy to turn from the Bible, to turn from the Word of God, right? And not be able to remember this. I don't want to remember this. But the song that you've heard over and over and over and over again from growing up, those don't go away. You can close your song book, but you still got the song up here. I turned off my radio long ago, but I still got those songs up here. They stay with you. It's powerful. Be very careful with what you're allowing to put into your mind. Think about this. This song was given, and they were supposed to be giving it to the mouth of, of, their, uh, of their children. What songs do your kids know? What do they have in their mind right now? Hopefully it's good songs. Hopefully it's good music. What are you allowing them to fill their mind with? Is it this world's garbage? Do they know all the world songs and none of the Lord's songs? Well, then how do you think they might end up turning out if that's the case? We know that God's not the only one that uses music to get a message across. I mean, it, again, you can look at all the, the music stars they all talk about the message that they're trying to get out, right? They write their songs and I just want to do this with my music and my art and, and I'm trying to impact people and impact the world. They're using it to get their message across. And you know what? Their message is not one of believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. I'll tell you that much. It doesn't, it doesn't take a theologian to figure that one out. Turn, if you would, to Colossians chapter number 3. Colossians chapter number 3. See, when you listen to music or sing music, you're actually being taught. The Bible says in the book of Acts, so the disciples, when they were being punished by the, by the Pharisees after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, they're preaching Jesus Christ, you know, they're, they're being uh, beaten up, and punished, and they answer, in Acts chapter 4, they, they, they give an answer, they say, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. They say, we can't help it. They were witnesses to these things. We, we were with Jesus. We saw his resurrection. We can't, we can't help but speak about these things, right? Well, it's still a true statement. The things that you see and you hear and you, you are part of, it's part of your life, you can't help but speak about those things. So the things that you're putting into your mind or putting in through your eyes when you're, watch, when you're watching media, when you're watching things, or when you're listening to things, you can't help but talk about those things. It just becomes part of who you are. 
Now, obviously, we're discerning, we're trying to judge whether or not we should be listening to this or not, but when, when you listen to the world's music, it shouldn't take long before you decide, you know what, I probably shouldn't be listening to this. But the problem that most people have is that I like that it makes me feel good. That's the hook. That's the catch. That's the draw. I said, I'm not, I'm not you know, saying that, I'm, that I was, I'm immune to this. Right? Or that this is that I don't understand. I understand full well. I know all the feeling that music can give you. And you feel and you go, like, how could this be bad? This feels great. Well, is morality determined by how good something feels? A man lying with a woman feels good, but you know what? It's wicked if you're not married. A lot of people say that, you know, drinking alcohol, drinking booze, hey, that feels good, but you know what? It's wickedness, it's wrong, it's sin. There's a lot of things that you can say feel good. Well, how can such a feeling be bad? Well, because if God says it's bad, then it's bad. And they're using this music and it's bringing a different spirit about you. And look, every genre of music has a slightly different spirit that it brings with it. I already talked about the rock and roll. It's like a rebellion, and it's, yeah, we're not going to do that. You know, there's, there's music that could bring literally like, like violence and, and just rage to people. You think about like the heavy metal and the death metal and stuff. And look, you know, if you like that music, oh, no, it doesn't. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. I'm sorry, Air Supply doesn't have mosh pits, right? Or, or these, you know, the Bee Gees. You, you find that at the heavy metal place. Why? Because it has that spirit. Because it, it, it's meant to just bring about that adrenaline, that rush. That's what it's going to do to you. The hip hop is designed to make you move your body in a way that God doesn't want you moving, especially with other people. And to dance in a way that's just ungodly. It's designed for that. That's, that's the spirit that comes along with the different types of music. Just, I mean, if you just take a step back, you realize that. They all have slightly different spirit, but it's not a good spirit. It's not a spirit of God. It's not something that we should be allowing ourselves to just get into our minds with. Colossians chapter 3, look at verse number 15. Because you're also being taught when you listen to music. I used to think that, you know, well, I, I like the music, like the sound, but I don't like the message. And I used to think that, oh, it's not going to impact me. It does. It does. Some of my favorite bands were, were, were total blaspheming, self-glorifying, proud, heathen reprobates. And you try to look past it because you like the way the song sounds, but you know what? It's going to impact you. It's going to impact you. It causes you to do things that you wouldn't normally do. And I've noticed this, and, I, and you know what? I can't, I can't fully articulate and explain, but just through my own experience in life, you know, I realized a lot of music was bad a long time ago, shortly after I got saved. But I decided to cling to it because I liked it. And I would try to deceive myself and make myself think, oh, well, it's not really that bad, right? I mean, so we always want to do with sin. You want to justify your own actions. Just like people want to justify drinking alcohol by saying, oh, well, Jesus turned water into wine. And don't worry, we'll get into that tonight. <laughs> okay, we'll get into some of that tonight. So come back this evening and we'll get full. You're like, what are you talking about? I, I mean, alcohol's fine. Come back tonight. We'll, we'll go over that. I would like to deceive myself into thinking like, well, I mean, this, this song I'm not going to listen to, but everything else. I would listen to a band called Nine Inch Nails. Trent Reznor is a devil. That guy is a devil. And if you guys don't know it, great. Praise God. But this is just one example. He has a song called Heresy that goes, God is dead and no one cares. If there's a hell, I'll see you there. Just open blasphemy. And, and look, I was a born-again Christian listening to this garbage. Do you think that's a good influence in my life? Do you think that helped me get to church? No. And that's just one song. Okay, there's, there's more filthy songs that he has out there as well. The guy had, had bought the door for um, 
Charles Manson, you wrote, when, when, they, when they did those killings, and at one of the murder scenes, the killers wrote on there um, something about pigs because they went in, they murdered some movie stars, and, and I forget exactly what the door said, but they like, wrote in blood. Trent Reznor bought that door and put it on his recording studio. Yeah. He has an album called March of, March of the Pigs. A lot of people didn't know that, did you? Okay, one example. That's one example. When you dig into this stuff, you realize, hey, there's way more going on here than you realize. It's not just some catchy song that you're hearing on the radio. Oh, it just sounds good. There's some really wicked people involved here, really wicked people behind the scenes. And, you know, a lot of these artists don't even write their own music. They have someone else writing it for you. You've got the sodomite reprobates like David Bowie and these other guys that write all kinds of music for all different types of bands. That's, that's what you're listening to. It's a bunch of filth and garbage and no Christian ought to have anything to do with it. Colossians chapter 3, verse number 15, the Bible reads, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts. To the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Look at this, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. This is the good music. This is what we should be doing. We should be, look at, teaching. Teaching means you're learning from what? From the songs teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. This is what we should be using to teach and admonish one another. But do you think that the world's music doesn't teach? Of course it does. We're commanded to teach and admonish one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. That's what we should be using to teach and admonish one another. Not the world's music. Flip over uh, back to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter number 5. It's a parallel passage to Colossians chapter 3. There's a lot, of, a lot of the same things are covered in Colossians 3 and Ephesians chapter 5. Look at verse number 18 of Ephesians chapter number 5. The Bible reads, And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is, goes now getting into the second part of the challenge. Right? We're getting rid of the worldly music. And we're replacing it with, and if you already got it gone, we're inserting the hymns, the psalms, the spiritual songs, and um, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. This is something that we all ought to do. This is, this is I mean, you can look at it like a New Testament commandment. So, and also, if you say, well, I want to be filled with the Spirit more, I want to be filled with the Spirit of God more, well, how about you do what it says here, because it says, be not drunk with wine, and wine, that's another, another spirit, right? That's why the booze and the liquor is called spirits. So again, I'm getting ahead of myself for tonight. There's a reason why it's called spirits, because it's going to bring another spirit on you when you consume that stuff, just like music brings a spirit. He says, don't be filled with that spirit, with drunk with that wine and success, he says, but be filled with the spirit. And, and there's not a period there. The verse continues speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. When you sing the praises of God and you sing God's music, it's going to help you be in the spirit. You'll be thinking of spiritual things. You're going to be praising the Lord. Guess what? That's going to help you be in the spirit. That's where you want to be. You don't want to be in the flesh. You want to be in the spirit. This ought to help you in work, this challenge. We're going to be doing this every single day. I recommend starting with this. Do it whenever you want. Just do, you know, we're singing four hymns. I would recommend starting off with at least one hymn. One or two. 
and then do another one, and then do another one. You could, you could space it out. It only takes a few minutes. But it'll help you to get in the spirit. And by the way, the challenge isn't to listen to hymns. I want to make sure I'm clear about that. It's not to listen to hymns. Serious. It's to sing the hymns. Okay, now, if you want to sing with while you're listening, that's great. That's fine. I don't have a problem with that. But, but the goal is to actually open up your mouth with your voice to sing praises to God. Don't listen to other people sing praises to God. You sing praises unto God. That's what's going to help you get in the spirit. Amen. Turn, if you would please, to, to Hebrews chapter 13. I, I want to show you something that's really interesting here. Preach a sermon just on this a few years ago, just because it, it popped out of me, and, and I think this is amazing um, verse and, and phrase here that's used, and it's actually used a few times in the Bible in reference to us praising God. And you're turning to Hebrews 13. I'm going to read. Well, yeah, just go ahead and turn to Hebrews 13. We're going to look at verse number 15. We'll just read it for you and and. You see what it says here in Hebrews 13, 15. It says, By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is, the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. But to do good and to communicate, forget not, for with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. It's about offering sacrifices to God. Think about, you know, in the Old Testament, they made sacrifices like, like physical, fleshly sacrifices with animal sacrifices. If you want to make a sacrifice to God today, the Bible says, let us offer the sacrifice of praise. Amen. To sacrifice, you're giving something. I'm going to offer up the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. Let's praise God. Let's offer up that sacrifice to God, the sacrifice of praise. God is worthy. For us to be able to offer. And, and what, a, what a great opportunity that God gives us the ability to give a sacrifice of praise. Hey, are you thankful for the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made for you? I'm thankful for that. Amen. Is there anything that I can do for God? God says, hey, you can offer up a sacrifice. How about the sacrifice of praise? Great. You know what? That's not even hard to do. It's not at all. Praising God for, for his goodness, for his mercy endureth forever. Amen. So many reasons to praise God and to be thankful. But what we see here in Hebrews 13, offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. This is another reason why I want to do this challenge because singing and giving praise to God is something that ought to be in our lives regularly. Not just in the month of December. This also should be part of your spiritual life. Not just in church, but in your life. Bible reading isn't just done in church. Praying isn't just done in church. Singing isn't just done in church, or it shouldn't be. It should be part of your life. Turn, if you would, to 1 Chronicles chapter 16. We're almost done. 1 Chronicles chapter 16. While you're turning there, I'm going to read from Jeremiah 33, which just has another reference to the sacrifice of praise. And it says in verse number nine, you're turning to First Chronicles 16. I'm reading from Jeremiah 33, verse 10. Thus saith the Lord again, there shall be heard in this place which ye shall say, which ye say shall be desolate without man and without beast, even in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem that are desolate without man and without inhabitant and without beast. The voice of joy and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the voice of them that shall say, Praise the Lord of hosts, for the Lord is good, for his mercy endureth forever. And of them that shall bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. For I will cause to return the captivity of the land as at the first, saith the Lord. And this is the prophecy, of course, Jeremiah. There's a lot of negative preaching of the children of Israel going into captivity. And Jeremiah look, lives through this time and preaches through this time of them actually being taken captive and being brought into, you know, into another land. And, and you know, he, he's going through the whole time. But then he also prophesies 
well, there's going to be a time now this land that's all desolate here that you think like everything's all gone. God is going to bring back joy. He's going to bring back gladness and the voice of the bridegroom and the voice. Of, and he's going to restore things and things will get better in the future. And, and he says, and of them that shall bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. This is another reference to, to making that sacrifice. This isn't just a New Testament thing. This is something that's an all time thing. First Chronicles chapter 16 we're going to see some commands to sing here. Look at verse number seven. It says, Then on that day David delivered first this psalm to thank the Lord into the hand of Asaph and his brethren. Give thanks unto the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the people. This is a command statement. This isn't, this isn't saying it's not conditional. It's not if. This is just saying give thanks unto the Lord. Now, it's a song, but the song telling you, give thanks unto the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the people. Hey, God's worthy of that. How about we go and, 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 and testify the deeds of God? This is a song that praises God, but instruction, teaching, what a great song. And you know what? The good songs, the godly songs are going to have instruction. You're going to be able to learn from them. It's not just some vain repetition over and over and over again about how awesome our God is. Okay, if you want a real spiritual song, there's going to be a little bit of meat to it. It should have some teaching to it and not just saying the same phrase over and over and over again 500 times. That is not spiritual. That is vain. Look at verse number nine. Sing unto him. Sing psalms unto him. Talk ye of all his wondrous works. So again, another commander of sing. Sing unto God. Sing psalms unto him. Verse 10. Glory ye in his holy name. Let the heart of them rejoice that seek the Lord. Jump down to verse number 23. This is still part of the same song. Verse 23. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Show forth from day to day his salvation. Declare his glory among the heathen, his marvelous works among all nations. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He also is to be feared above all gods. And you could read all that song, um, but it's a great song. But we're seeing some commands to sing. Now we're going to close off in the book of Psalms. Turn, if you would, to Psalm 150. I'm just going to read... From Psalm 47, uh, verse 6, the Bible reads, Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises unto our King, sing praises. For God is the King of all the earth, sing ye praises with understanding. Psalm 92, Bible reads, It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and to sing praises unto thy name, O Most High. It's a good thing. We're trying to do a good thing here. Let's sing praises unto God. Sing to the Lord, to show forth thy loving kindness in the morning and thy faithfulness every night. So, you know, we want to know where my recommendation is coming from, singing in the morning and singing in the, in the afternoon and singing in the evening. Show forth thy loving kindness in the morning and thy faithfulness every night upon an instrument of ten strings and upon the psaltery, upon the harp with a solemn song, sound. Psalm 150, we're going to close with this. It's the last psalm in the book of Psalms, which, by the way, the book of Psalms is a songbook. It is the biggest book in the entire Bible when you just look at the con just, just how much there is there. And, I mean, it, that ought to mean something. If just the biggest book out of all the books of the Bible is a song book, this ought to be part of our life. And if it's not, change. You might say, you know what, though? i am just never really been into music. I don't like it that much. How about we sing praises unto the Lord? That's just not the type of person I am. How about we sing praises unto the Lord? There's a lot of reasons to do it. And, and you know, I brought up this analogy before too. You might say, well, I'm not that good of a singer. Okay. First of all, for this challenge, you don't have to sing in public. You don't have to. Now, I think everybody should be singing in the congregation. Amen. Everybody. We should have 100% participation in singing in the congregation. I don't care how you sing. But at home, you don't have to sing in front of other people. You can still complete the challenge like you would if you're praying in, in secret. Okay? You can still do this. But what I, what I want people to understand is that God is the one who made your tongue and made your voice the way that it is. You don't have control over that, but he gave that to you. 
and he knows what he gave you with and what talents he's blessed you with. But that doesn't change when, he's, when he wants to receive praise from us, whether or not your voice sounds the way you think it should sound. Because God gave you the voice the way that he thinks it should sound. And you know what he wants to hear from you? He wants to hear your voice. He doesn't just want to hear the voice of the perfect, that the person that has the perfect voice. He wants to hear the sound of your voice. And, you know, I, I, this truth hits closer to home when you have kids and you hear them sing. Because while other people might find the songs of children and their singing kind of annoying to a parent, I love it. I love to hear my children sing and, and to have, especially when they're singing hymns and it's coming from their heart and they love the song and they're singing a praise unto God. I love to hear that. I love to hear every single one of my children sing. Think about how God feels in heaven. I mean, we're just like little kids. He's so far above us. He's our Heavenly Father. You think He probably wants us to sing unto Him. He, wants, he loves to hear that. He wants to hear the praises, and He deserves it. Look at Psalm 150, verse number 1. The Bible says, Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in the firmament of His power. Praise Him for His mighty acts. Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. Praise Him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the psaltery and harp. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him with the stringed instruments and organs. Praise him upon the loud cymbals. Praise him upon the high sounding cymbals. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Closes out the songbook, the book of Psalms, with this psalm, with every single verse saying, Praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Praise him for this. Praise him for that. Praise him for this. Praise ye the Lord. It starts off and it ends with praise ye. Ye is plural. All of you. All y'all praise the Lord. All right? This is southern talk, right? <laughs> praise the Lord. So this is our challenge. And hopefully you can, you can you know, make this part of your routine. Make it part of your life. Don't just stop in December. Continue on. Sing, you know. It doesn't have to be four every day, but this is the challenge. We're doing four every day. We're getting rid of the worldly music, and we're going to focus on praising God. I guarantee it's going to help you be in the Spirit more often, and it's going to bring more joy to your life. Let's bow our eyes have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for, um, for your instruction. God, you always know what's best for us. God, I thank you that you've, um, you've instructed us to praise you and to sing these songs because they are good for us, Lord. And, and uh, I pray that you would please help everybody to overcome many doubts or fears that they might have uh, or, or just self-consciousness of their own voices or whatever the hang-up might be, that, that everybody can, can just participate in praising you, God. Uh, we love you. There's so many things to be thankful for and... Um, God, please just bless our church. Help us to be able to walk in the Spirit uh, increasingly more and more. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.